Development for the seventh Final Fantasy began in 1995, one year after the release of VI. Square had been experimenting with the idea of a 3D RPG ever since V was released on the Super Famicom, and the demo with SIGGRAPH showed Square could shift its style forward a dimension. It just didn't reveal how. Nintendo's next-generation machine would be cartridge-based, and while its 64-bit system would be the most powerful on the market, cartridges with a great deal of memory were incredibly expensive to produce. Looking at its finances, and the concepts it was cooking for the next Final Fantasy, Square was forced to make a difficult decision. Saying goodbye to their sprites, and Nintendo, which had provided two generations of hardware for Square to revive itself with, the company announced on January 12, 1996, the series would continue exclusively on the Sony PlayStation. Square wouldn't release another game for a Nintendo console until Crystal Chronicles for the GameCube seven years later. The team Square assembled to tackle the project was 100 Strong, one of the largest ever devoted to a single game's development. They had a budget of $45 million in cutting-edge film production tools like Power Animator and Soft Image 3D. Sony launched a $100 million advertising campaign to bring anticipation to a boil. Due to its extraordinary goals, the game's release date was pushed back almost a full year on a new console with new technology and a concept that was a far cry from the themes its fans had grown to love. Square wasn't too far from where it had been almost 10 years earlier. Its next game would either boost it to superstardom or summon the imminent doom of the company. Final Fantasy VII was released in Japan on January 31, 1997, and American gamers had to go on hearing how amazing it was for another nine months. Hironobu Sakaguchi remained at the helm, maintaining a lead production role. Yoshinori Katase continued on from six to direct, and series veterans Yoshitaka Amano and Nobuo Uematsu returned to their usual duties. Kazushige Nojima assisted Sakaguchi and Katase with the writing, and Tetsuya Nomura, who joined the team for five, designed the characters for the first time. His manga style was deemed more compatible with the basic 3D structure of the game. While previous fantasies had you gradually enlist in forces struggling to save the world, Seven rushed you right into battle with the Resistance group on a mission to destroy a toxic reactor. The self-absorbed swordsman Cloud Strife initially had little interest in joining the Rebels, but if the pay was right, he was willing to hang around. A monopolizing megacorporation called the Shinra Electric Power Company was slowly sucking the life out of the planet and freedom fighters known as Avalanche were the only ones willing to fight back. As an ex-member of Soldier, Shinra's squad of genetically enhanced elite warriors, Cloud was stuck fighting for the good guys whether he liked it or not. He was asked to sign up by his childhood friend Tifa, and bossed around by its outspoken leader Barrett. The small resistance army would grow to include the wild experiment Red 13, the bubbly thief Yuffie, the feline puppet Kate Sith, the shadowy gunfighter Vincent, and after rescuing her from Shinra headquarters, the spiritually serene heiress. For the most part, the game shared a point of view similar to PlayStation predecessor Resident Evil. There was a fixed camera and pre-rendered backgrounds. Polygonal characters moved where the environment would let them. One of Sakaguchi's main concerns with continuity was the moments between these scenes. In an attempt to cover loading times, many animations or short in-game cinemas were implemented. This began the time-honored tradition of the Final Fantasy in-game cutscene. Final Fantasy VII employed over 40 minutes of full motion wonder, the most impressive use of video as a gaming tool for its time. In addition, there were a number of cinematic transitions which used the same models and backgrounds in the game that seamlessly blended them into the action. The battle window also gained cinematic enhancements. The camera was almost constantly moving, highlighting magic spells, special abilities, and enemy attacks. These smooth perspective patterns were also random, ensuring you rarely saw the same angle twice in one fight. The sequences that did repeat were the elaborate summons. Some of them were close to a minute in length. Your party size was cut down to three, forcing you to simplify your attack strategies. You also only had three items to equip in your inventory, a weapon, armor, and an accessory. This appeared quite restrictive at first, until Barrett revealed the game's ability system, called Materia. 
These colorful orbs were formed out of crystallized Mako, the blood pumping in the planet's veins, called the life stream, and the source of the world's power. Possessing a piece of materia made you spiritually linked to the planet's spirit, and the memories of those who had returned to its source after death. This connection gave you numerous spells and bonuses, similar to espers and relics combined. But you didn't learn these skills, each materia did, and when you swapped their assignments, the experience level traveled with them. Materia leveled on ability points after each battle, and characters got more materia slots as their weapons and armor improved. Job-specific battle behaviors like covering, stealing, and casting spells on multiple targets were now assigned to specific materia. Along with being spiritual power generators, the orbs gave you stat bonuses reflective of their abilities. Like Esper's, materia also played a major role in the story, as white and black materia became pivotal to the balance of the planet. Black materia cast Meteor, to which the only defense was Holy, which required white materia. Both these spells had made prior appearances in Final Fantasy, but never had they affected the world so significantly. When your party was pushed to the brink, a new bar began flashing next to their active time battle indicator. When they received damage, it filled up, and at its peak, the attack option was replaced with character-specific limit breaks. You couldn't choose from the whole list, though, and had to assign which of the four groups to bring into the fray. You could unleash them the second they were earned, or save them for another battle. Sid hopped back in the pilot seat in Seven as an aggressive aeronaut with dreams of traveling into outer space. His attitude and style was reminiscent of the character's first appearance in Two, and a departure from the older, bearded design gamers had met in Three, Four, and Five. He donated the tiny Bronco, a small craft that doubled as a boat after it was shot down. He also welcomed you aboard his Lady Luck, the High Wind, which shared his last name. He took up a lance and aided you in battle for the second time in the series, sharing his pedigree and many abilities with the Dragoon Kane from Final Fantasy IV. Chocobos chirped you across the landscape, but you had to call them by equipping the Chocobo lure materia to bring them into battle. You could then race your newfound pets by entering them in speedways at the Golden Saucer. After you won your first Choco chase, the manager Dio gave you a land roving buggy that was open to enemy attacks, but chugged over rivers and deserts. The saucer was like Pleasure Island, with several interactive minigames requiring dexterous button selecting. These time trials also emerged in the story, making pivotal moments tense with the fear of getting one step behind. They also ensured the following games would have an equal amount or more of playful diversions that could absorb your time when you weren't worrying about the end of the world. Seven dealt with surprisingly mature subject matter, from an inclusion of cross-dressing as a mission objective, to an open reference to prostitution. Barrett was the first leader bold enough to utter several obscenities, and the only central black character in the entire franchise. It was also the first entry to show blood. They say the metal of a man is tested in adversities, and anyone who would dare stand against Sephiroth would find out immediately what they were made of. Therefore, it's ironic that Cloud didn't realize who he really was. Sephiroth was the strongest soldier alive, but wouldn't rest until he controlled the planet. He sought to bring Meteor down to the surface, tearing a wound so deep that the life stream would emerge to cleanse it. There, he would join with it, becoming a god with the planet's pulse at his fingertips. Eris also rediscovered her identity as a direct descendant of the Cetra, or Ancients, a race that nearly vanished thousands of years ago. They were run off their homeworld by Genova, a vampiric alien lifeform that crash-landed in a meteor long before anyone could remember. Cloud's feelings were split between Eris and longtime pal Tifa, as the story had two female leads seeking affections for the first time. You could choose who to court and who to ignore, but it wouldn't matter. At GDC in 2004, Steven Spielberg said, I think the real indicator that games have become a storytelling art form will be when somebody confesses that they cried at level 17. He never played Final Fantasy VII. The grand story in VII was a compilation of a number of inspirations. With the release of Final Fantasy VI, Sakaguchi was faced with the death of his mother. Wrestling with grief led him to develop a number of the concepts in VII, such as Genova. 
Further depth was drawn from religious beliefs that center on rebirth, or the cycling of souls, back to a great mystical body, most apparent in the life stream. The name Sephiroth also comes from the mythology of the Kabbalah, referring to spiritual manifestations of the ten heavenly attributes. <laughs> Final Fantasy VII was a marvel of technology and a commanding display of limitless imagination. The only thing that lessened its impact was that, were it not for Ifrit, Shiva, and Chocobo riding Moogles, the game was almost unrecognizable as a Final Fantasy title. The series went from being classically medieval to ambiguously futuristic. Castles became skyscrapers, wyverns became helicopters, minecarts became motorcycles, and bows became machine guns. <laughs> While fans will eternally debate which Final Fantasy is the best, no one can argue that 7 is the most popular, or the one that left the largest stamp on the industry. It was the first Final Fantasy to be released on the PC. The snowboarding minigame was ported to mobile phones in 2005, and in 1998, Cloud, Tifa, Sephiroth, Yuffie, Vincent, and Zack all appeared as playable combatants in the fighting game Ergie's God Bless the Ring. Their inclusion led many to call the PlayStation release the Final Fantasy Fighter. Shortly after the turn of the century, Nomura and Kitase were approached to create a polymorphic project that could expand one of the Final Fantasy games across multiple mediums, in an effort to prove the franchise was capable of breaking out of its Roman numeral namesake. Kitase immediately suggested Seven as the perfect candidate, because its ending left numerous avenues open for the story to continue. The project was called Compilation of Final Fantasy Seven. Its ongoing catalog includes Before Crisis, a prequel to Seven focusing on the Turks, Shinra's version of the CIA. The turn-based adventure storyline follows the Shinra investigators as they fight the precursor to the avalanche introduced in Seven. The mobile phone exclusive series ran for 25 episodes in Japan, and the last entry was released on April 1st, 2006. A PSP game was also introduced called Crisis Core, which stars Seven's underappreciated hero, Zack, Cloud's savior, and Eris's former boyfriend. But the first video game to hit stores under the compilation umbrella came from an unexpected genre, the shooter. Combining a first-person perspective with the back-flipping melee action of Devil May Cry, the last chapter in the saga of Midgar focused on the unfinished business of Vincent Valentine. Dirge of Cerberus was released in Japan on January 26, 2006. Cerberus had Vincent facing off against an army of rogue soldiers called Deep Ground, whose intent was to call forth Omega and end the world. Every living thing eventually returned to the life stream, and Omega was the entity that would one day collect all the energy and return it to the stars, leaving the planet as a crumbling rock disintegrating into space. Despite Vincent's obvious ease at using Cerberus and dodging enemy fire with flare, the gameplay in Dirge was admittedly constrictive. This was apparent due to several changes made to the game before its US release seven months later. Dirge had a mobile add-on called Lost Episode, released on August 18th, 2006. And then there's the infamous trailer shown during the Sony press conference at E3 2005 that teased millions by demonstrating what Final Fantasy VII would look like if it was recreated for the PlayStation 3. Although it was solely intended to act as a technical demonstration, many fans mistook it, and still do, as a trailer for a forthcoming rebirth of the PlayStation Classic. Even if the game never returns, the universe of Final Fantasy VII continues to expand. The fan community on both coasts has continually called out VII as one of the best video games ever created. At a financial results conference in 2006, Square Enix president Yoichi Wada claimed the compilation of Final Fantasy VII would be around for another 10 years which would end the celebration on its 20th anniversary. Join us next week for another installment in our 13-part Final Fantasy Retrospective. In part six, we'll highlight the other releases on the PlayStation, two sequels that are the best examples of how drastically different a pair of Final Fantasy games can be. One attempted to raise its characters up to tell a feature-length love story, and the other brought the franchise back to its forgotten roots. Run!